Assalamu alaikum guys welcome back so, okay so in this lecture we are going to talk about the cooperative binding of hemoglobin to oxygen and the cooperative behavior of hemoglobin what that is and how it influences the ability of hemoglobin to accept oxygen in different uh, in tissues and in the lungs okay and how it changes the structure of hemoglobin uh, in different oxygen concentrations and you're gonna look at each one of them one by one okay so what is cooperative binding we are gonna know just in a bit and the reason for sigmoid graph well uh, we are gonna uh, we'll come to this in a bit okay when oxygen is added to one of the heme groups of the hemoglobin it causes the iron to move into the plane of porphyrin and causes the attached F8 histidine to move as well. All right, I'm going to take the help of this diagram over here. Uh, this is taken from your book, uh, Lip and Cot. All right. Now, uh, since you guys are already familiar with the structure of a heme group, I have discussed about the heme group in the previous lectures as well. You can check them out. I have given the link to one of them in the description as well. Right. So, a heme group is basically uh, an complex formed between a ferrous ion and a protoporphyrin 9, a tetrapyrrole ring structure. Now, that uh, this is the tetrapyrrole ring structure, okay, it contains uh, four nitrogen uh, atoms of the py four pyrrole rings and each of the nitrogen is coordinated with the ferrous ion in the center. Now, uh, these nitrogens that are shown over here to the left and to the right of this ferrous ion, these are actually the nitrogens of this entire ring okay these are uh, represented in uh, two dimension it's just shown over here but this is actually an entire uh, protoporphyrin ring structure okay attached to the ferrous ion what happens is that when oxygen is not attached to this ferrous ion this ferrous ion is not within the plane of the protoporphyrin 9 it is outside the plane of the protoporphyrin 9 it is not inside the plane of the protoporphyrin 9 okay and once it gets oxygenated once this ferrous ion uh, gets oxygenated it's uh, it basically it has a bond over here that is free right so this free bond actually in fact it has two bonds which are free which are not attached to the protoporphyrin 9, but the uh, one of the two bonds is attached to a histidine uh, amino acid. This histidine amino acid is called the proximal histidine, uh, proximal F8 histidine, which is attached to the ferrous ion through a covalent bond, and it is uh, present in the uh, F helix, F alpha helix of the uh, globin chain. All right, and the bond which is free it gets bonded with an oxygen molecule now what happens is that uh, after binding to this oxygen molecule this oxygen molecule uh, shifts the ferrous ion into the plane of the protoporphyrin 9 okay it actually kind of pulls the ferrous ion into the plane of the ferrous uh, of the protoporphyrin 9 and so now it's in the same plane as the nitrogens of the protoporphyrin 9 so it's in the same plane as the uh, protoporphyrin 9 so this oxygen binding to the ferrous ion of the heme group it shifts this uh, ferrous ion into the plane of the protoporphyrin 9 and causes it to uh, uh, move in in the same plane it uh, it actually comes in the same plane as the protoporphyrin 9 okay what does this movement signify the, what this movement does is that it uh, since this ferrous ion is attached through a covalent bond to the f8 helix this f8 helix uh, this f8 uh, sorry the f8 uh, histidine uh, the F8 histidine, which is attached to the ferrous ion through a covalent bond, it is also attached to the rest of the uh, uh, globin chain. So this movement of the ferrous ion, what it does is it causes this uh, uh, histidine molecule to also move. And this movement of the histidine molecule along with the ferrous ion, it kind of breaks some of the bonds in the rest of the hemoglobin structure. Okay. Uh, and so now this ferrous ion is brought into the plane of the uh, protoporphyrin 9 and once it uh, is brought into the uh, plane of the protoporphyrin 9 some of the bonds break and some of the bonds in the adjacent hemoglobin uh, chains break if we go back to the structure of hemoglobin uh, for example if this uh, ferrous ion is uh, uh, oxygenated for example, uh, let's look at this. Uh, for example, there is a ferrous ion in this uh, chain and this gets oxygenated. What it does is that it causes a change in the globin chain around it. This globin chain, uh, some of the bonds break 
and uh, what it does is it induces a chain in the adjacent globin chain and the adjacent uh, globin chains uh, ferrous ion the uh, also the globin chain around the ferrous uh, ion or the heme group of the adjacent uh, hemoglobin subunit it uh, changes it loosens some of the polar bonds break and then what happens is that uh, the structure of the hemoglobin becomes a bit relaxed it becomes and this relaxed structure of hemoglobin has a much a greater affinity than the original tight structure of hemoglobin now this relaxed structure will allow uh, more or will allow subsequent oxygen molecules to be added more easily okay for example if you look at uh, this uh, diagram on the right the hemoglobin originally had no oxygen so this was the original p conformation the tense conformation uh, conformation hemoglobin and it uh, had very low oxygen affinity so it was very difficult to add the oxygen molecule the first oxygen molecule to this hemoglobin but now once this oxygen molecule is added due to high partial pressure of oxygen for example in the lungs uh, the partial pressure of oxygen is very high so that is enough for the oxygenation of one of the heme groups okay now once one of the heme groups is uh, oxygenated it uh, uh, in which in that uh, heme group this phenomena occurs the iron ferrous ion moves into the plane of the protoporphyrin ion this uh, induces a change in the entire globin chain and that this globin chain interacts with the adjacent globin chains and a change is uh, induced throughout the hemoglobin molecule and this loosens the chain of this loosens the hemoglobin chain to some extent and allows the hemoglobin to accept subsequent oxygens more easily it increases the affinity for oxygen of the hemoglobin as we go down so then the next oxygen that gets bind that binds to the uh, mono oxygenated hemoglobin it uh, binds more easily and then similarly when another oxygen binds the affinity further increases and the shape becomes more uh, like the r conformation more relaxed and uh, as a result of this what happens is that this last oxygen uh, this last hemoglobin before accepting the last oxygen molecule uh, it has three oxygen molecules and it has approximately 300 times the affinity of this original hemoglobin chain from where it started out so this hemoglobin which has now uh, three oxygen molecules attached to it it has the highest affinity as compared to its previous forms uh, because it is the most relaxed state now and then it accepts this oxygen molecule at an affinity 300 times its original uh, teeth conformation and so now this Uh, oxygenated hemoglobin in the r conformation then forms okay and so this is how the affinity of oxygen varies uh, when subsequent oxygen molecules are added and this is the mechanism by which it happens uh, the ferrous ion moves into the plane of the protoporphyrin ion it interacts with the histidine f8 histidine which is covalently attached to the ferrous ion the movement of the histidine induces a change in the globin chain which is attached to this histidine and then that globin chain interacts with the adjacent globin chains which interact with the adjacent heme group and then that heme group uh, accepts oxygen more readily right so that's why this uh, phenomena is also called heme to heme interaction right so basically it's not a direct interaction between the heme groups but rather an indirect interaction between the heme groups uh, by the uh, intervention of the polypeptide chains in between them all right and so eventually the affinity of hemoglobin molecule increases even further now let's move on to the next uh, slide all right the t conformation and the r conformation uh, i i have gathered some uh, important bullets over here and it it would be uh, for the, both the t conformation and the r conformation i told you in this lecture uh, in this slide that the t conformation was the one the tight conformation it was a deoxygenated form which had very low oxygen affinity so now uh, some additional points over here it is the deoxy conformation of hemoglobin we've uh, uh, talked about that it is uh, t stands for taut or tense or tight okay same thing the, because the globin chains are very tightly held to one another then the alpha beta dimers in this form are tightly held together through a network of ionic bonds and hydrogen bonds 
Okay, this third bullet is something that you know from the previous lecture. We've discussed this in the previous lecture. Uh, I'll show the slide. Okay, in the previous lecture, we said that in between the dimers, the alpha beta dimers in between them, there are weak ionic and hydrogen bonds. And this is what I was, I'm talking about over here, that it's the weak ionic and hydrogen bonds that are relatively stronger in the T form as compared to the R conformation. In R conformation, some of these bonds breaks. And as you can see from the number of lines, that only three lines are left, only three bonds. Uh, well, this doesn't mean that in reality there are only three bonds, there are multiple bonds, but this is just a comparison, okay? That there are only like a few bonds left in R conformation as compared to the T conformation, which is a, a more uh, tighter conformation for the hemoglobin. Then the next bullet says that the extensive interdimeric bonding hinders the movement of the dimers relative to one another. All right, how does the T form change into R form? How does that occur? This occurs only when the dimers, these dimers, they move relative to one another, okay? They uh, start moving relative to one another. Only in that case uh, does the conformation changes, okay? And uh, this movement, it causes the bonds to break. If uh, no movement occurs and these bonds are strong, if these bonds are strong, then they, uh, this movement will be hindered, okay, in the T conformation. The movement of the one... Uh, dimer relative to the other in the T conformation will be hindered because these bonds are pretty strong. But in the R conformation, while forming the R conformation, as oxygen binds to the uh, ferrous ions over here, and this ferrous ions moves, this movement of ferrous ions, it uh, breaks some of the ionic bonds, and due to which the dimers can then easily move relative to one another. And this form is the low oxygen affinity uh, form of the hemoglobin. Uh, we've discussed this. And... Um, this form is essential in order to supply oxygen to tissues efficiently. Okay, this last bullet is important. Okay, now how is this form important for supplying uh, for efficient supply of oxygen to the tissues? Well, if the hemoglobin, for example, uh, this is a capillary, okay, and uh, this capillary uh, binds and then it goes and there are some tissue cells in between the capillaries, okay. Now, if uh, he, uh, red blood cells pass through the capillary, and they uh, lose their oxygen over here. It's important for the hemoglobin, it's important for the hemoglobin to change to a T conformation so as to prevent the hemoglobin from acquiring or from absorbing that oxygen again, okay? Once the hemoglobin has lost its oxygen, it changes into the T conformation and then this T conformation cannot easily absorb that oxygen again. So, it is actually an efficient way of delivering the oxygen from the hemoglobin to the tissues which require that oxygen. If this uh, hemoglobin had not changed into the T conformation, then this oxygen might not have been lost from the hemoglobin to the tissues and might not have been efficiently delivered to the tissues. So that's why the T conformation is very important. Now, uh, that's it for this slide. And now, R conformation. Let's talk about the R conformation as well. This is also a very important conformation. R means relaxed state or relaxed conformation of the hemoglobin. This forms when the uh, hemoglobin is oxygenated. And again, this links with the same uh, slide over here. Uh, when it gets oxygenated, some of the polar bonds break. And this break uh, breakdown of the polar bonds, it actually breaks some of the... It allows the dimers to move relative to one another and so subsequent addition of oxygen molecules will allow the hemoglobin to gain a more relaxed state and so it will allow, allow it to accept more oxygen molecules more easily. Oxygen binding to the ferrous ion in the heme group causes the globin chains to loosen up by breaking some of the polar bonds between the dimers and we've discussed this in this slide over here. Okay. Then moving on, in the deoxygenated form, the ferrous ion is not in the plane of the protoporphyrin ion, but binding of the oxygen to the heme iron pulls the ferrous ion into the plane of the protoporphyrin ion. And again, talking about the same stuff, binding of oxygen brings it into the plane of the protoporphyrin ion. Since the heme group is bound to the proximal histidine as well on the F8 helix, the resultant movement of iron into the plane causes the globin chains to move. Okay, this heme group, uh, it's again the same story, okay, the heme group is bound to this proximal F8 histidine and as it moves, it moves the proximal histidine with it and this movement of the histidine, it breaks some of the bonds and allows the dimers to move relative to one another. Okay, now this movement leads to the relaxed form of the hemoglobin, 
okay and this relaxed form is a high oxygen affinity form of the hemoglobin and this is important for the uptake of oxygen efficiently from the lungs as well okay uh, this is important because now uh, once uh, this actually increases the efficiency of the hemoglobin in accepting oxygen from the alveolar airspace in the lungs okay in the lungs uh, initially uh, hemoglobin is in the t conformation so that it could not accept the oxygen back from the tissues but once it reaches the lungs due to the high partial pressure of the oxygen in the lungs and alveolar airspace one of the hemoglobin molecule one of the heme group gets oxygenated and once it, uh, it gets oxygenated, it shifts into the R form. And once it shifts to the R form, this R form has a greater affinity as compared to the T form. And so it, uh, it more readily accepts all the four oxygen molecules and gets 100% saturated, right? The hemoglobin gets saturated due to its R conformation, right? And uh, due to this T and due to this R conformation, uh, as I talked in the first slide over here, the reason for the sigmoid graph this binding of uh, hemoglobin this behavior of hemoglobin to bind to oxygen with high affinity and with low affinity is the cooperative behavior of hemoglobin to oxygen okay this conformation conformational change the t form and the r form the t form in the uh, deoxygenated form and the r form in the oxygenated form is referred to as a cooperative binding of hemoglobin to the oxygen it is also called the heme to heme interaction because the uh, uh, heme groups in the hemoglobin they uh, cooperate with one another in binding oxygen molecules and binding subsequent oxygen molecules so when one oxygen binds to the heme group it cooperates uh, with the adjacent heme groups and allows it and helps it to accept further subsequent oxygen molecules more easily so that's why this is called the cooperative behavior of hemoglobin and this is the reason this is the reason why the oxygen dissociation curve of the hemoglobin has a sigmoid shape okay sigmoid means uh, an s shaped uh, an s shape it has a sigmoid a shape due to this cooperative behavior of hemoglobin okay and we are going to talk about the sigmoid uh, graph a sigmoid oxygen dissociation curve in great detail in the upcoming lecture and in that i'll uh, ex try explaining why that is sigmoid due to the r and the t conformation of the hemoglobin and what's its important okay in, in the transport of oxygen from the lungs to the tissues okay so thank you so much meet you guys in the next lecture